What's the two things you need to believe in order to get it? You need to believe these two things. Number one, that Yeshua is your Savior. Number two, that He saves you from your sins. As long as you believe those two things and you're honest to what the text says, you can get it. So let's see that, that He saves us from our sins. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, it says, And she, that is Mary, shall bring forth the Son, and you shall call His name now, his name in Hebrew is Yeshua. We've most commonly said Jesus. But his name in Hebrew is Yeshua, and the word Yeshua in Hebrew means salvation. So in other words, you're going to call the name of the Messiah, call his name salvation. Well, why is his name salvation for? Because it goes on to say, he will save his people from their sins. Call his name salvation because that's who he is. He's the Savior. Call his name salvation because that's what he does. He saves his people from their sins. And so then, in Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2, and verse 11 says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. So Yeshua is your Savior. Yeshua saves His people from their sins. So if you can believe that and accept that and be honest to that being true and be honest to what the text says, now I want to show you James chapter 4 and verse 12. And it says, James chapter 4 verse 12, the first part of the verse says, there is one lawgiver who is able to save. So in that verse, it says that the one that's able to save is the lawgiver. There's one lawgiver that saves, that is able to save. Well, who's the one that saves? Yeshua saves. He's Savior. So that verse says the one that saves is also the lawgiver. And so then, back to Exodus in chapter 19, verse 18, it says that Mount Sinai was on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of the furnace. And then it says, and the whole mount quaked greatly. It shook. And when he spoke, his words were like thunder. And when he spoke, it caused... A shaking. Now, if you can understand that that's what happened at Mount Sinai, we can also see that Yeshua gave the Torah from the New Testament. If we pay attention to what we're reading from Hebrews in chapter 12. So Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 24, it says, And to Yeshua, the mediator of the new covenant. So that verse is talking about Yeshua. And what's it saying about him? It's saying he is the mediator of the new covenant. Okay, next verse. See that you refuse not him that speaks. Okay, who's him? Well, in order to know who him is, I've got to go back to the previous verse to get the context of who him is. Him is Yeshua, the mediator of the new covenant. It's talking about him. Don't refuse him that speaks. For if they escape not who refused him that spoke on the earth, and so him that you're not supposed to refuse, Yeshua, the mediator of the new covenant, it says he spoke on the earth, verse 26, whose voice then shook the whole earth. So Yeshua, the mediator of the new covenant, you're not to refuse. And his voice shook the whole earth. When? At Mount Sinai. So it's telling you, if you know that at Mount Sinai, that the, her, the whole mount quaked greatly when he spoke, you can see then Hebrews is saying that Yeshua, the media of the new covenant, is the one that gave the Torah at Mount Sinai. We can see it this way as well. Um, in John chapter 14 and verse 
15. John chapter 14, verse 15, it says, this is Yeshua speaking, if you love me, keep my commandments. Did he say, if you want to be saved, keep my commandments? No, because we're saved by grace through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's what it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. We're saved by grace through faith. So now Yeshua says, if you love me, if you love him because you're saved by grace through faith, keep my commandments. Well, when he spoke those words, love me and keep my commandments, he was making a reference to the very first place in the Bible where we see the phrase, love me and keep my commandments. Where's that? That's in Exodus chapter 20, verse 6. Exodus chapter 20 is the chapter on giving of the Ten Commandments. Who's the one that's saying those words? Well, the one saying those words in Exodus chapter 20, verse 2, I am the Lord your God which brought you out of the land of Egypt. That's the one speaking, the one that brought him out of Egypt. And he says in verse 6, showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So the words love me and keep my commandments is initially spoken at Mount Sinai. That's the very first place in your Bible where you're going to see that phrase, love me and keep my commandments. So when Yeshua said, if you love me, keep my commandments, he was, in the mind of his audience, he was referring them back to Exodus 20 because they would have known the Ten Commandments. And so by connecting them back to Exodus 20, verse 6, the context of Exodus 20, verse 6, the one that's saying those words is the one that A, brought them out of Egypt, and B, giving them the Torah at Mount Sinai. So when Yeshua said, if you love me, keep my commandments, he was saying that he made covenant with Abraham, he brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, and he was saying that he gave the Torah at Mount Sinai, and he was saying that he's Yahweh Elohim. Just by reference, just by context, just by making a connection of what he's saying back to Exodus in chapter 20, verse 6. We can also see this as well. When we cross-reference what Yeshua said in Matthew in chapter 11 in verses 28 through 30 with Jeremiah in chapter 6 and verse 16. Now in Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 16 it says, Thus says the Lord, Stand in the ways and see and ask for the old path, which is the good way, and walk therein, and you shall find rest for your soul. And so the phrase, you will find rest for your soul, that phrase is associated with ask for the old path, and that old path is a good way, and follow it. Walk therein. You will find rest for your soul. So Yeshua is referring back to this verse in what in Jeremiah 6. Verse 16 is the old path. That's the good way that Jeremiah is calling his people to walk in. It's following the Torah that was given at Mount Sinai by Yeshua the Messiah. And you will find rest for your soul. So Yeshua makes reference to this in Matthew in chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, which says, Come unto me. All that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And then he says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. So the thing that we're supposed to learn of him is called his yoke. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. If you learn of me you will find rest for your soul. What is it that we're supposed to learn of him? What he teaches. And if he gave the Torah at Mount Sinai, what is it that we're learning from him? We're learning the Torah because he taught the Torah in parables. Then he says this. 
about his yoke, about learning of him. He says, not only will you find rest for your soul, but then he says in Matthew 11, verse 30, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, I'm not going to call Yeshua a liar. And if he says it's easy, and if he says it's light, then it's easy and light. And if he says it's easy, I'm not going to make it hard. If he says it's light, I'm, go I'm not going to make it a burden. He says it's easy and it's light. So why is it easy? What makes it so easy and what makes it so light? Well, that's because he doesn't put the responsibility upon us to do it in our, in our own understanding and in our own ability. He doesn't, he doesn't ask us to do it in our own understanding and our own ability. Now in Ezekiel, Ezekiel in chapter 36 in verses 26 and verse 27 it says a new heart will I give you a new spirit will I put within you it's talking about I'm going to put a new spirit within you I'm going to take away the stony heart and give you a heart of flesh he's taking away a stony heart and giving you a heart of flesh. What is that? That's heart surgery. If you're taking out one heart and putting in another heart, that's heart surgery. So he's going to perform heart surgery because the problem's with the heart. And in performing heart surgery, he's going to put his spirit within you. Verse 27. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, keep my judgments, and do them. So he says, I want you to follow my Torah, but in order to help you to follow my Torah, I'm going to put my spirit within you. And so this is what Yeshua said about the spirit or the Holy Spirit in John chapter 16, verse 13. It says, when the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you in all truth. Now he's got to put his spirit within me to help me to follow his Torah so it can be easy and light. And then he says, the spirit of truth will help you, will guide you in truth. So if the spirit of truth guides you in truth, what is truth? In Psalm 119 and verse 142, it says, thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and your Torah is truth in Psalm 119 verse 151 it says you are near O Lord and all your commandments are truth the spirit of truth will guide you in truth truth is the Torah truth is the commandment if you love me keep my commandments and so therefore it's he hasn't asked us in our own understanding. He hasn't asked us in our own ability. He's given us His Holy Spirit within us. What is His Holy Spirit within us? That's the new covenant. So what is the new covenant? The new covenant, Hebrews in chapter 8 in verse 11. The new covenant, Hebrews chapter 8 Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10. Hebrews 8, verse 10. What's the new covenant? For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my Torah in your mind and write it in your heart. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. The new covenant, the new covenant is the Torah written upon your heart by the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit teaches you and guides you and leads you into following the Torah. So, the new covenant is the Torah written upon our heart. And so, what is the will of God? How do we know the will of God? So, Psalm in chapter 40, verse 8, tells you what the will of God is. It says, I delight in to do your will oh my god your torah is within my heart i delight to do your will 
your Torah is, when, is within my heart. His will is his Torah written upon our heart. Well, what is the Torah written upon our heart? That's the new covenant. So his will is the new covenant. His will is that we follow the new covenant. And his new covenant is he's going to give you his indwelling Holy Spirit to help you to follow his Torah. But he also takes away the stony heart when he... When, he, uh, when we walk in the new covenant, what's the stony heart? A stony heart is a, star, is a heart that doesn't want to follow the Torah. And uh, we can see um, this uh, definition in Zechariah in chapter 7. Zechariah in chapter 7 in verses 11 and 12 but they refused to hearken they pulled away the shoulder they stopped their ears that they should not hear they made their hearts as adamant stone lest they should hear the Torah and the words which the Lord of hosts has sent in his spirit by the former prophets so when they wouldn't receive the correction and the instruction of the prophets who called the people to return to the covenant, return to the Torah, it says in their disobedience, they made their hearts as adamant stone. So the God of Israel found fault with the hearts of the people. It was stony. So he says, I need to correct this problem. I need to do a heart surgery. So I'm going to take away the stony heart and I'm going to give them a new heart. Now, in order to help them with this new heart, I'm going to give him my indwelling Holy Spirit. And I, I'm, going to, I'm going to give him a new covenant. In the Hebrew it means renewed. So I'm going to renew the covenant. Because the original covenant was broken. And the original covenant was written upon heart of stone. So I'm going to, I want to correct the problem. I want to change their hearts. And I'm going to renew the covenant. And this time I'm going to write my Torah upon a heart of flesh. And it says... And you will be my God, and I will be your people. That phrase, I will be your people, and you will be my God, is a phrase that gives you the understanding of a marriage. So um, he's going to marry a people that believes that Yeshua is the Messiah, who's walking in the new covenant, who has the indwelling Holy Spirit, and they're following his Torah by his spirit. And so this is what Paul testified how he believed in Yeshua and how he sought to follow Yeshua. Now, most Christians aren't aware that Romans chapter 3 verse 31 is in their Bible. Most Christians are not aware that Romans chapter 3 verse 31 is in their Bible. Because most Christians say of Paul, most Christian churches and most Christian denominations say of Paul that Paul taught that we shouldn't follow the Torah. They say that Paul taught that because of faith in Yeshua as the Messiah, because we're saved by grace through faith, they say that Paul taught that we therefore do away with following the Torah. Ironically, Paul asked that question in Romans chapter 3, verse 31. So here's what the verse says. Paul says, Do we make void, make void means to do away with, do we make void the Torah through faith? Here's a question that he's asking. Do we do away with following the Torah because of faith? Because we're saved by grace through faith. Well, Christianity testifies that that's what Paul taught, that we do away with following the Torah because we're saved by grace through faith. But Paul answers the question. He answers that question. And he says, God forbid we establish the Torah. So Paul says, we're saved by grace through faith. After we're saved by grace through faith, we establish the Torah. So how are we supposed to follow the Torah? By the Holy Spirit. And that's how he testifies that he follows 
Yeshua. In Romans chapter 7, verse 22, Paul says, I delight in the Torah of God after the inward man. So, you know what Paul was complaining about in the book of Galatians and other places? He was opposing believing in Yeshua in trying to follow the Torah by the instruction of the rabbis. That's what he opposed. Is a people that believed that Yeshua was the Messiah and then listen to what the rabbis say as the rabbis being the, th the authority on how you're supposed to follow the Torah. That's what he opposed. Because he was brought up learning the Torah from the rabbis and from their perspective. But once he came to faith in Yeshua as the Messiah in Acts chapter 9, he says in Galatians and, el and elsewhere, he went alone and he, and he thought about things and he, and he reevaluated things. And he got an understanding. He got a revelation. He saw Yeshua in the Torah. And once he saw Yeshua in the Torah, he knows now Yeshua is the Messiah. He's going to follow Yeshua. And now he understands and sees Yeshua in the Torah. And now he knows his Bible well enough that Ezekiel prophesied that we're going to follow his Torah by the Holy Spirit. So therefore, Paul endeavors to do exactly that, what the Bible says. He's going to believe in Yeshua as Messiah. He's going to follow his Torah, and he's going to do it by his spirit. And if somebody else wants to believe in Yeshua as Messiah, and then try to follow the Torah by um, regarding that how the rabbis teach it, as they are the authority regarding what it means to follow the Torah, Paul says, no, that's another gospel. So... Paul didn't reject following the Torah. What he did is he changed how he understood the Torah and he changed how he followed the Torah. He didn't reject following the Torah. He changed how he followed it. So then he goes on to say in Romans chapter 7 verse 25, I thank God through Yeshua HaMashiach our Lord that with my mind I serve the Torah of God. So he made a decision to follow the Torah, but he's going to do it by the Spirit of God. And Yeshua said, if you follow my Torah by my Spirit, it's easy and it's light. But what did Yeshua say about following the Torah according to the rabbis? He said they lay heavy burdens on the people. When you try to follow the Torah by what the rabbis say, he called it heavy burdens. But he says about following his Torah by his spirit. It's easy. It's light. So, to furthermore see this, in Isaiah, in chapter 33, and verse 22, Isaiah 33, verse 22, it says, The Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. That verse says four things about the Lord. It says he saves us. It says he's our judge. It says he's our king. It says he's our lawgiver. Those four things it says about the Lord. Well, let's look at those four things. Those four claims. One of them is he saves us. Well, who's the one that saves us? It says in, in Matthew 1.21, you will call his name Yeshua. He will save. So Yeshua is the one that saves us. Okay, what about judge? It says he's our judge. Now the one that saves us is our judge. Who's our judge? In Romans, in chapter 14 and verse 10, it says, For we will all stand before the judgment seat of Messiah. If we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Messiah, he's being our judge. Now the verse says the one that saves us and is our judge is also our king. Well, who's our king? In Revelation, in chapter 19 and verse 16, it says about Yeshua, He has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. So Yeshua saves us. He's our judge because we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Messiah. And he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So Isaiah 33 verse 22 says that the one that saves us and the one that is our judge and the one that is our king is also the lawgiver. Once again, showing that Yeshua 
gave the Torah at Mount Sinai. Do you realize um, I started going to church when I was a little boy and, and I went to church as long as I could remember. So let's say for the sake of argument since I was five years of age because uh, my neighbors who were of retirement age came and asked my mom and dad if they could take me to church. My mom and dad said yes, so they started taking me to church when I was a, a little boy. So I, I, and I went to church every Sunday. I wouldn't miss uh, going to church. And so um, I decided that the Bible's true. I decided there's a God. I decided when I heard John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life, I decided that that was true. And I decided that to believe it, and I decided that he was my savior, and I would give my heart to him. And therefore, he promised me that I would spend eternal life with him. So then, um, I tried to learn and understand the Bible the best I could. I, I, I went to Sunday school every Sunday. We had Sunday school before church, so I went and I tried to learn my Bible through Sunday school. And then as I got older and I wanted to learn more, I would, I would go to Christian bookstores. I would buy books on certain topics. I would, I would listen to um, uh, people on uh, radio and TV and buy their CDs and, and, and buy their tapes and listen just to try to learn the Bible the, the best I could. So here I am. Um, I'm... Uh, I'm into my uh, 20s, and uh, even um, up to uh, 30 years of age, which is about 20 years ago, and here I'm spending all my time going to church and, and doing all these studies of the Bible and hearing all these pastors and, and all these sermons on the Bible, but never once did I ever hear anyone say that Yeshua gave the Torah at Mount Sinai. Not once. And so um, um, what I'm sharing with you um, God had shared with me um, as um, or when I was an adult. And so this is not what I was taught. This is not my mindset. This is not my viewpoint of the Bible. But I had already decided that I'm a Bible believer. And now once he showed me that that, that is what this book says, um, I decided I wasn't going to argue with the book. I decided that I was going to believe the book, and um, it didn't invalidate my life. I already knew that I'm saved by grace through faith. I already knew that I tried to live my life the best I could, and God looks and sees the heart. And uh, I, I just didn't know that he gave the Torah at Mount Sinai. And so once I realized he did, and I've decided to follow him, no turning back, no turning back, then I have to change the way I think. And so I decided, okay, he gave the Torah at Mount Sinai. What does that mean? And so first of all, I need to learn and I needed to understand what Torah was. Because I even had a misconception of what the Torah is. Because it was always presented to me that the Torah is the first five books. So that's what I thought it was. But I came to realize that that's really not the true definition of Torah. That the Hebrew word Torah comes from the Hebrew word Yerah. So Torah, which comes from Yerah, it means teaching or instruction. So if God wants to tell you something, that means Torah. He's teaching you. He's explaining something to you. There's something he wants you to know. We say it this way, obeying God. So really, obeying God, the Hebrew word for obeying God is following Torah. Well, I want to show you a couple examples that the first five books isn't just the Torah. And I want to show you, I'm going to give you the the New Testament to show you this. The first one is 1 Corinthians in chapter 14 and verse 21. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 21, Paul says, in the Torah it is written. So he's saying that this, what he's about to say is in the Torah. And what does he say? In the Torah it's written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak to this people. And so you look at every verse, every word in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, you will not find that quote. But Paul said in the Torah, that's where it's written. Where do you find the quote? You find the quote in Isaiah in chapter 28 and verse 11. Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 11, which says, With stammering lips in another tongue will I speak to this people. So Paul 
said Isaiah 28 verse 11 is the Torah and the Torah that was written. Paul is calling Isaiah the Torah. Now I want to show you what Yeshua calls the Torah. In John chapter 10 verse 34 he said, Yeshua answered and said, Is it not written in your Torah? I said, you are God's. You won't find that in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, but you will find that in Psalm in chapter 82. And he's actually quoting from Psalm 82 and verse 6. I have said, you are God's, and all of you are children of the Most High. Yeshua called the Psalms the Torah. Paul called Isaiah the Torah. So what really is the Torah? The Torah is the Word of God, and the Word of God is the Torah. The Torah is the Word of God, and the Word of God is the Torah. Let me show you this. If we go to Psalm 119 and verse 105, it says, Thy word, your word, is a lamp to my feet, in a light to my path. Your word is a lamp. Your word is a light. Your word is a lamp. Your word is a light. Is a light. Now, cross references with Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 23, which says, For the commandment is a lamp, and the Torah is light. Psalm 119, verse 105 says, The Torah. It says, The word is light. But Proverbs chapter 6 verse 23 says that the Torah is light. Psalm 119 verse 105, your word is light. Proverbs chapter 6 verse 23, your Torah is light. So his word is the same as Torah. We can also see this in Isaiah. In Isaiah in chapter 2 at the end of verse 3. Which says... Out of Zion shall go forth the Torah and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. That's Hebrew parallelism, where Zion equals Jerusalem, Jerusalem equals Zion, and from Zion goes forth the Torah and the word of the Lord. Goes forth the Torah and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So, Torah is the word of the Lord, and the word of the Lord is the Torah. So now that you understand that Torah means teaching or instruction, and it's the same as the word of God, what is it that you and I believe is the word of God? Right there. Genesis to Revelation. So according to the definition of the word, teaching or instruction, then Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is Torah. Acts is Torah. Romans is Torah. Galatians is Torah. Revelation is Torah because it is the Word of God. And so then, one of the things we're told about the Holy Spirit in John in chapter uh, 16 in verse 8, Yeshua said when, the, when He comes, the Holy Spirit comes, He will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness and justice. The Holy Spirit will reprove the world of sin. Well, what is sin? The Holy Spirit will convict people of sin. What is sin? In 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, it says, Whoever commits sin transgresses the Torah. Sin is transgressing the Torah. Sin is not following the Torah. That's what the New Testament says what sin is. So in other words, you never ever sin unless you don't follow the Torah. Well, Christians like to say, well, uh, the, the Torah doesn't exist today. The Torah is, is not in operation today. Well, Paul said in Romans in chapter 4 in verse 15, Paul said in Romans chapter 4 verse 15, he said, where there is no Torah, there's no transgression. There's no sin. If there's no Torah, there's no sin. So if there is no Torah in operation today, there's no sin, meaning it's not possible to sin. Because sin, by definition, is 
the transgression of the Torah. And so one of the things that the Holy Spirit will do is he will teach us and, and he will correct us. And so just as loving parents correct their children, we have a loving God that corrects us as well. Do we need corrected on everything that we believe and do? No. You see, Yeshua is the Messiah. We don't need to be corrected on that. He is the Savior. We don't need to be corrected on that. Um, if we confess our sins and receive His shed blood for the forgiveness of our sins, uh, we will be forgiven our sins. We'll be saved. We don't need to be corrected of that. Um, we are saved by grace through faith. We don't need to be corrected of that. And whether you realize it or not, if you help the poor and the needy and feed the poor and the needy, you're following the Torah. Because the Torah says to, to feed and help the poor and the needy. So whether you think that's following the, the Torah or not, according to the definition and what's said about following the Torah, if you feed the poor and the needy, you're following the Torah. If you honor your father and your mother, you're following the Torah. If you be nice to somebody today, um, if you love them, if you hug them, if you do something good for them, you're following the Torah. Whether you realize it or not, you're following the Torah. So um, whether we realize it or not, um, we're following the Torah in some aspect, in some dimension, all the time when we're trying to do right and do what's good. We're following the Torah. Whether we think of that we're doing it or not, by definition, we actually are. So by being a loving parent, we, we're called the children of God. We're called the sons of God. That um, he's wanting to correct us in the areas where we need improvement. Not in the areas that we've already got it right. We already know Yeshua is the Messiah. We already know that we're saved by grace through faith. We already know that we're supposed to help others and feed others and be nice to others. We already know all that. And hopefully um, we're doing that. But when Messiah comes at his second coming, he's coming for a bride. And he wants his bride to make herself ready. And part of making herself ready is knowing who he is. You know, it's a good idea if a bride knows the person that she's marrying. Because if she ends up marrying somebody, and when she was dating them, she finds out after she says, I do, they're not the person that she thought that she was marrying, there's going to be problems. And so... Um, if, if we believe in Yeshua as the Messiah, we know He's our Savior, and we're going to have such an intimate relationship with Him that we're His bride, um, we should at least know that He gave the Torah at Mount Sinai, and um, we should be willing to correct those areas where we need improvement on while maintaining those areas that we are already doing well. So, um, we're told in 1 John, in chapter 2, and verse 6, He who says he abides in him, he who says he's a believer in Yeshua as the Messiah, in other words, it says, ought to walk as he walked. So, um, I see myself as a believer in Yeshua, as a follower of Yeshua. So if I'm going to follow Yeshua, I have to go and follow in his footsteps. I have to walk as he walked. So all that I have to know is how he walked. Did Yeshua keep the Sabbath? Then if I walk as he walked, I keep the Sabbath. Did Yeshua keep Passover? Then if I walk as he walked, I'm supposed to keep Passover. Did Yeshua not eat pig? If I walk as he walked, then I am not to eat pig. I am to walk as he walked. And so um, Messiah is coming for his bride. And it says in Revelation in chapter 19 and verses 7 and 8, that the bride makes herself ready. And so this is a part of making herself ready. And in making herself ready, it says she's dressed in fine linen, clean and white. She's dressed in fine linen, clean and white. And so in 
John in chapter 15 and verse 3, Yeshua said, You are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. And in John chapter 17, verse 17, he said, Sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. And so I am to walk as he walked. He kept the Sabbath. I keep the Sabbath. He kept Passover. I keep Passover. He didn't eat pig. I didn't eat pig. Well, in Hebrews, in chapter 13, and verse 8, it says, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, Yeshua HaMashiach, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same. So if he kept Sabbath when he was on this earth, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Then that's what he does. He keeps Sabbath. If he kept Passover, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Then he, when he returns and sets up his kingdom, he's going to keep Passover. If he didn't eat pig, then when he returns, he's not going to eat pig. And so why is it that he's returning us and making us aware of keeping the Sabbath and the festivals and these things? Because um, Paul said in Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, that they are a picture or a shadow of something to come. So um, in doing these things, um, you would probably initially ask, okay, why are we doing this for? And, and, and what's the meaning of this? Well, he wants you to ask those questions. Because if you ask the questions and you seek for the answer to the questions, you will find that Sabbath and Passover and Pentecost and Tabernacles, that they are going to give you an understanding of both his first coming and his second coming. And um, he wants his bride to make herself ready. And part of her being dressed properly so she's prepared for his return is the insight in knowing why and how to be prepared comes through the celebration of, of Sabbath and the festivals and these other things. It is for the purpose of the bride making herself ready. And so we, and the call that he's given to us is he wants us to be his bride. And in the biblical marriage, there's two major stages to the biblical marriage. The first is betrothal, where you are, are legally married to, but you do not physically dwell with. When we accept Yeshua as the Messiah, we are legally married with, to him, but we don't physically dwell with. The second stage of the marriage is when he physically dwells with us. And the application of that is twofold. First, when he sets his feet down in the Mount of Olives, in the kingdom, the thousand-year kingdom that he sets up. And then secondly, he's going to dwell with us for all eternity. And so he wants us to be ready for his return to dwell with us. So he's given us the new covenant in the Holy Spirit to prepare us. Because it says, I'm going to write my Torah upon their mind and their hearts. I will be their God. They will be my people. In other words, that's the preparation of my bride who I'm going to marry. And so this is why God is putting out the call uh, to those who believe on him to um, make yourself ready because he's coming for a bride. He's eagerly waiting um, to come and to marry his bride. And he's calling all of us to be that bride that he's coming for because he wants us to rule and reign with him and live forever with him. And that is good news. So I pray that the message has been a, a blessing uh, to you and it's, it's helped you to, um, 
to understand Yeshua on a deeper level that he's not only your savior but he gave the Torah at Mount Sinai and he gave us the new covenant to follow that Torah and the Holy Spirit so if you've been blessed I pray you have been um, I want to give all praise glory and honor to Yeshua himself because he and he alone deserves all of our praise glory and honor so it's in his name for the glory of his kingdom and the fruit of his kingdom that we meet here tonight and we do these things so it's his it's in his name that uh, we say amen and shalom um, thank you um, it's it's a quarter after nine and on our docket here is some times for uh, for Q and a and so um, um, unless otherwise stated according to our schedule here um, I would like to give um, this opportunity uh, for any um, questions uh, that you might have and uh, we can do this up through the next 15 minutes before I hand over the mic. So uh, does anybody have any um, uh, comments, questions um, regarding uh, anything I shared tonight? Yeah. Um, have you been able to preach this message to Orthodox Jews? And if so, what sort of reaction? Well, as you know, it's kind of difficult uh, uh, to uh, speak about Yeshua before Orthodox Jews because um, if if uh, they become aware that um, uh, a Christian is in their neighborhood um, and they want to share Yeshua, they get out their rocks and they get out their eggs and they, and they puncture your tires. Um, and so just as Paul got uh, the reaction when he was trying to minister, um, you know, that's, this becomes uh, a reaction um, within the Jewish community in general and the Orthodox Jew, uh, community uh, in, in particular. But it says in Ecclesiastes that there's a time and a season for everything. And so there's a time and a season for that as well. And, uh, and so the, the Lord will make a way um, when the time is ready. Any other thoughts, questions, or comments? Why do you call it the Torah and not the Bible? Um, well, Torah is just a Hebrew word, okay? It's just a Hebrew word that means uh, a teaching or instruction, okay? And so um, um, the name that we've given for this book um, is called the Bible. And actually, to be honest with you, I've never did a word study on what the word Bible means. <laughs> probably just means a book. Um, it probably means a sacred book. And so, um, you know, Torah, Torah means teacher or instruction. And as I was trying to uh, explain, if you really understand the true meaning of the word, uh, given that it does mean teacher and instruction, the way we would understand um, the application of that is Genesis to Revelation. Even as Paul called Isaiah the Torah and Yeshua called Psalms the Torah. So, um, it's just language, I guess. Any other thoughts, questions, or comments? Okay, if there's uh, no other uh, comments, I'm going to give the mic on, uh, over. And um, I want to really thank you for coming out tonight, uh, your time and attention. You know, to come out on a weekday night, there's only one reason why you come out, and that's because you love the Lord. Mm -hmm. And um, I love the Lord, you love the Lord, we all love the Lord, and we're all trying to serve the Lord and do the best we can and to help one another in those efforts. And so thank you for allowing me uh, to come and share, and I pray that He has blessed you in doing so.